Hello there! This box contains indeed what it claims to contain. Yes, the super rare SGI 1600SW TFT panel from 1998. Come on in and join me for a deeper look. I love old computers. I love to collect them. I love to fix them. I'm the vintage collector and these are my stories. This episode is sponsored by PCBWay.com, your source for CNC machining, 3D printing, PCBs and more. In the mid to late 90s, the PC market was still widely dominated by those bulky heavyweight CRT displays. Of course, flat panel displays were nothing new, as we've been seeing LCD flat panels using TN, STN, DSTN and other technologies since the 80s, although early precursor technologies were around since the 50s already. Also, Apple featured an LCD panel in their 20th anniversary Mac in 1997. But SGI was definitely running ahead with the 17.3 inch 1600SW flat panel display featuring a then uncommon 25 to 16 aspect ratio at a 1600 by 1024 pixels resolution. With a stunning 110 dots per inch, the dot pitch was way ahead of competing products for the time, and even the initial asking price of roughly two and a half thousand US dollars made it really an attractive package. With only some 54,000 units ever produced, the 1600SW display is a highly sought after device and a rare get on eBay, but I was really lucky to find one in Germany, including the original packaging. And the box itself is still in a very nice condition, if I'm ignoring the fact that it accumulated various delivery stickers over the years. Obviously, this display made quite a journey, with it being handed over to different owners several times through the last 25 years. There are so many layers of transportation labels and duct tape, which I'm gently removing with the help of a heat gun. Here's eventually another transportation label revealing itself after removing two more layers atop. I had to work very carefully in order to not destroy the original SGI labeled duct tape as I really want to keep this one intact. It's a tedious task and it took me some 2 hours to get rid of all superfluous labels and duct tape to get the box back into more or less the original condition, less some scuffs and marks here and there. But eventually comes the moment of truth to open the box. There's already a smaller box on the top, which contains some accessories and even the delivery slip to complain about dead on arrivals. So here we have a power supply and many different display cables for DVI, VGA and the SGI's Open LDI digital video connector. The box also contains the multi-link adapter, which does what the name implies, allowing you to connect the 1600SW to different connector standards. This one is especially important if you plan to connect the 1600SW to an ordinary DVI or VGA interface, as without a multi-link adapter this weren't possible, as the display itself features only a proprietary connector. Along with the box came this bill, stating the buying price of 1185 euros in 2002. And guess I just paid some 250 euros for both the display and the multi-link adapter, which was really a bargain. So I think it's about time to take the monitor out of the packaging. The styrofoam wrapping comes with this lifting handle to pull the entire thing out. I'm really excited to unwrap it and connecting it to the SGI-02. Oh yes, it turns on! Awesome! Now, in case you're wondering why I put the compact keyboard there, the answer is because the SGI keyboard that I had had a USB connector and didn't work with the USB to PS2 adapter. And that again is owed to the fact for me being too lazy to remove the PS2 keyboard from the display desk. 
Anyways, it's working and allows me to not only boot into the PROM, but also into IRIX. The display is currently connected to the Multilink adapter using the VGA cable. It works, but it has the drawback of not fully supporting the 1600x1024 pixels display resolution. The SGIO2 addresses the display via the default 1280x1024, so the entire image appears stretched. You can actually switch the 1600SW display between scaled and native mode, which would result in having bars left and right when running on a 1280x1024 resolution. The official way to use the 1600SW at max resolution is to use the O2 digital interface adapter, which I'll cover in a moment. And this is where my episode sponsor for today, PCBWay, comes into play. PCBWay offers a wide range of services around CNC machining, PCB production, including full assembly services and 3D printing on over a dozen of prototyping materials. When joining PCBWay first time, you'll benefit from a one-time $5 welcome voucher. Use the link in the video description below to join up with PCBWay. There's also an unofficial way which involves some configurative changes on IRIX to force the 1600x1024 through the onboard VGA graphics adapter. But this runs the graphics board on the edge of its capabilities and is not really recommended. I didn't bother to try this myself as I don't want to screw this precious machine with weird experiments. Instead, I'm about to install this O2 Digital Interface daughter board. Originally, I didn't have it in this machine and it didn't come with the display either. So I had to organize it first. Luckily, I found one for a still affordable price at Mashek.com and Dog of Mashek Systems was more than helpful to me. In order to use the O2 digital interface, the system must run at least IRIX 6.5.2. And if you remember my previous video about how I acquired this O2 workstation, I did only the install of IRIX 6.5.0 base OS to this point. Going through the entire IRIX upgrade procedure goes too far for this video, so I'll be covering that in this separate follow-up video. The procedure for installing the digital video interface is outlined here. And once I had the machine upgraded to RX 6.5.30, I'd remove the system unit from the chassis. I have to remove this bezel and also lift out the PCI riser card. For the latter there's a lever that needs to be pushed down, which helps in pushing it out from the PCI slot. Technically, the mainboard is mounted to the drawer using just three screws on the backside and two further ones which fixate the CPU board. Once I remove them, according to the installation instructions, I should be able to pull out the mainboard from the drawer. But somehow I was stuck, so I started unfastening all the screws on the backside bezel. Well, at least this loosened things up to this point that, with some wiggling around, the mainboard eventually came out from it. I did notice though that one of the backside mounting screws here at the SCSI connector was broken off. I may need to use a drill here, but as I currently see no negative impact by that broken off screw, I just leave it as is. With the mainboard removed I'm now able to plug in the digital interface card. It's a bit fumbly and I truly believe that installing it would have been a lot easier if I actually removed the sheet metal plate, even though the instruction didn't strictly require me to do this. Anyways, after partly reassembling it, I was then to quickly mount the system unit back into the chassis in order to perform a functional test. But can you imagine how I felt when I observed Eric suddenly complaining about network issues? At first, I thought I had some issues coming from the previous Eric 6.5.30 upgrade. But checking on the configuration, it all looked just about fine. All I did notice was though, that I couldn't ping anything on the network anymore. And 
If Convict showed me that the connection was negotiated to 10 megabits half duplex, which is obscure, as I definitely have a 100 megabits capable switch on the other end. So I was trying to restart the network interface manually by running the if down and if up commands. And the latter eventually brought me that error message here, complaining about an invalid station address. So I was then quickly inspecting the system inventory and I was terrified by finding the MAC address for the network interface to read all but F's. So it's being equal to the broadcast address. I remember having a similar problem with the SGI Indy at an earlier occasion when the RTC had died, causing the machine to lose the MAC address. Now is the question, did I screw something just by installing that digital interface card or did the RTC chip just die in the vein of this very moment? I then went on to do some investigation and found out that on the SGI-02 the MAC address is actually not stored into the RTC but behold on a small chip that sits on the PCI riser card. Damn! I was installing the system unit on purpose without the riser card because of being too lazy for not requiring to assemble and disassemble everything in case of a malfunction. But I wasn't aware about this particular restriction, so my intention backfired to me. May I comment on that? The reason the MAC address is stored on the riser board is simple. Many commercial licenses in the professional segment sold either with a hardware dongle or were bound to the network MAC address instead. So in case of swapping out the system's mainboard, you would just put the PCI riser card back in, essentially retaining the MAC address and thus not invalidating your expensive software license. I see, and it's actually quite clever and I really wasn't aware about that. At least, after reinstalling the riser card, I'm happy to find the system also working again from the networking point of view and not having screwed it. In the end, it's about time to find a suitable spot for the O2 and its fantastic 1600SW display. It's pretty dense here already, but I think I have an idea to make some room. Let's move that stuff out of the way, shall we? Ah, I better shouldn't have done so. Once I started moving things around, I found this. My spoop, how disgusting. Well, we do have two cats and they can come in freely as they wish. And yes, sometimes they bring their prey along and let it run loose. It is what it is. And then I had that picture hanging on the wall previously and I had to make some room for the shelf. Still, I need to cover up the hole. It doesn't look too nice at the moment yet, but eventually, once dried, I can brush it up so it won't be visible anymore. There was also a lot of stuff to move around, but eventually I'm all done and the O2 has its designated place of honors exactly as it deserves. Oh, and it comes up. Awesome! And the system manager also shows the presence of the digital interface. So let's see if it is any good to play around with Quake 2. Ah, uh, well, that's not exactly how I envisioned it. It's laggy as hell. Guess after all, I now have uncovered yet another topic to follow up. Now, you see me smiling, don't you? If it weren't for George, I wouldn't have the SGI-02. But who could have guessed that I'll find the matching flat panel display that quickly? Or would you have gone with one of these bulky 19-inch CRTs instead? Let me know in the comments below. I'm the Vintage Collector and this was my story for today. Next video is due Sunday in a week. And if you can't wait, why don't you check out any of these other videos on this channel? Thanks for watching and see you next time.